Well, we're continuing this morning in our series of messages from the Gospel according to John that I've entitled, The Message Became Flesh. And uh, preparing for this week's sermon, I've been reminded of something I've enjoyed doing since I was uh, a small child, and that's swimming. I've always enjoyed being in the water, splashing around, diving under, coming back up for air. Uh, It's just always been something I've enjoyed a lot. And uh, if you want to enjoy being in the water like that, uh, there's one requirement. You have to be willing to leave behind the dry ground. You have to be willing to surrender to the experience of being in the water if you're ever going to enjoy it. Uh, You have to leave that dirt you stand on behind to get into the water. That's kind of what Jesus was trying to talk to Nicodemus about in the passage we're going to be looking at today. I've titled today's message, Your Darkness or God's Light. And we're in John chapter 3. We'll be looking at the first 21 verses. Let's go ahead and read verses 1 and 2. Now there was a man of the Pharisees, Nicodemus by name, a ruler of the Jews. This one came to him by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as teacher, for no one can do these things that you are doing unless God should be with him. We have in this an approach to Jesus from a Pharisee that seems to be a little bit different than the Pharisees we tend to run into in the gospel accounts. Almost always, in fact, I think Nicodemus is the only exception. Every other time we hear about Jesus having an encounter with a Pharisee, uh, it's some kind of a confrontation. They're either challenging him or Jesus is challenging them and they are responding to him with hostility. But uh, there's, there's this uh, confrontation throughout Jesus' ministry with the Pharisees. Uh, and uh, they, they considered themselves the uh, teachers of Israel, these uh, people who safeguarded the teachings of the rabbis of the past, and they did not write them down at this point. They believed that these teachings had to be memorized and that this oral tradition, which Jesus refers to as the traditions of the elders, uh, you know, when he says things like, you have heard that it was said to the ancients. He's talking about this oral tradition of the Pharisees, this body of interpretation of Scripture that they had committed to memory word for word, and they were safeguarding for future generations uh, by memorizing it. So they, the Pharisees considered themselves the expert. Their knowledge of all that the famous rabbis of the past had taught about Scripture was encyclopedic. They had this depth of knowledge, and they were uh, widely considered to be the, the best experts on Scripture in the first century. That was their kind of claim to fame, that, that they were the ones to consult if you had a question about Scripture. And most of the time, these respond to Jesus with uh, kind of circling the wagons and defending what they have built. They have this whole tradition that they are trying to uh, impart on people around them and their understanding of things. And they have invested so much in this. When Jesus shows up and starts challenging that and establishing whole new paradigms for how we are to approach God, uh, the Pharisees responded with great hostility to Jesus. And yet, Nicodemus is a, a happy exception to that. Nicodemus actually approaches Jesus and wants to seek an audience with Jesus. Now, another thing about Nicodemus that might make him a little distinct, uh, other than his attitude towards Jesus, was his position. Now, in the first century, uh, the wealthy people in Jerusalem tended to be the Sadducees, and their sphere of influence was the temple. They were Levites, they were involved in the temple worship, and from the temple tax, as we were talking about last week, they had accumulated enormous amounts of wealth so that the Sadducees and the chief priests and the priestly families uh, were very wealthy and because of that also had become very politically influential and very connected. The Pharisees typically were not wealthy. 
they were of more modest means, uh, probably more what we would consider something like middle class. Uh, but their sphere of influence was that everybody considered them the experts on the law and on the teachings from Scripture. So that was their arena. Nicodemus seems to be a unique figure in that he seems to cross over between these two worlds because he is described as a ruler of the Jews. Most people interpret that to mean, and we find out later that that's the case, that he was a member of the Sanhedrin. And uh, the Sanhedrin was the supreme court of Jews. And this was the highest political uh, authority and governing uh, institution that the Romans had allowed the Jews to have. So to be a member of this Sanhedrin meant that he was among the elite, among the 72 most powerful Jews in uh, the first century. And the only office that would have been higher than uh, a member of the Sanhedrin would be the chief priest, which also the Romans at this time established. It was a political post, uh, not simply uh, one handed down uh, through heredity. Um, so Nicodemus is probably a wealthy, influential Pharisee which means he's, he's kind of involved in both worlds, the, the teaching in the synagogue and the politics that are involved in Jerusalem and all that kind of thing. And we're told that he came to Jesus by night. Now why exactly John chooses to ex include that detail is not clear because John never specifies why Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. Uh, at least two possibilities are probably... Uh, out there. Uh, one could be he went at night because he was embarrassed for people to see him consulting Jesus and was afraid of what the other Pharisees might think of him, so he went to him by night. Uh, another option uh, might be that uh, he approached Jesus by night because he felt like in that circumstance he would be able to secure a quiet one-on-one -on -one encounter where he could actually ask some of these deep questions he had to ask and we could do so without competing with all the crowds uh, trying to get Jesus' attention. Um, we're not sure uh, why he came by night, but it serves John's purposes because through this encounter, a theme that John is going to develop in this passage is the idea of darkness and light. And the fact that he comes by night, uh, I think, talks to the darkness out of which Jesus will later uh, speak to him about drawing him out of it. Um, but notice how he addresses Jesus. He doesn't say the kinds of things the Pharisees generally say about Jesus. They generally challenge him or they dismiss him or they make some snide comment about his birth. Or, uh, you know, they, uh, sometimes they flat out accuse him of being work, working under the power of the devil himself. That's not the way Nicodemus addresses Jesus. First, he calls him rabbi. Now, for one of the most respected Pharisees of the day to address Jesus as rabbi, uh, that was not an honorific that he would just throw out willy-nilly. Uh, he understood the, the weight in Jewish life that the title rabbi carried with it. So he addresses him as teacher, as rabbi, and knows that Jesus does not have the formal training that would be necessary in normal situations for a person to reach the status of rabbi. You would have, normally, you would have to train at the feet of a respected rabbi and learn all the oral traditions and become an expert and have memorized uh, the traditions that you need to pass on to your own disciples. Uh, once you've uh, been deemed trained and worthy, then you could aspire to the title rabbi and take on disciples and be one of these people who uh, impart teaching. But uh, Nicodemus knows Jesus doesn't have that kind of training. He hasn't trained at the feet of any significant rabbis. Um, he's not been endorsed uh, specifically by uh, the Pharisees. But uh, Jesus is often addressed as rabbi. People intuitively understand. And here's how Nicodemus words it. We know that you have come from God as teacher. 
How do we know that? He says, for no one can do these signs that you are doing unless God should be with him. And here's what Nicodemus understands about Jesus. Yes, he does not have the credentials we're accustomed to demanding. But God has worked in him in such a way and he has performed miraculous things through him that validate who he is. There has been a witness born by God himself on behalf of Jesus so that a man who can heal a person born blind, a man who can heal a paralytic, a man who can uh, teach with this level of authority without ever having been endorsed by any rabbi, clearly indicates that God's hand is upon him and God has empowered him to do what he's doing. Nicodemus sees God at work in Jesus and unlike all of his fellow Pharisees, he doesn't see that as a challenge to his power and authority. He seems to celebrate that, that Jesus has showed up and that God is at work in him. And uh, the fact that he comes to Jesus and addresses him as rabbi and says, I know God has sent you as a teacher. He's setting the stage to ask him questions. Jesus, I recognize that you are in a position to instruct me. And uh, that attitude of humility with which he comes before Jesus, all of this convinces me that in Nicodemus we have a different kind of Pharisee than we're accustomed to seeing. Let's keep reading verses 3 through 8. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly I say to you, if one is not born from above, he cannot see God's kingdom. Nicodemus says to him, How can a man be born if he is an old man? He cannot enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born. Jesus answered, truly, truly I say to you, if one is not born of water and spirit, he cannot enter into God's kingdom. What has been born of the flesh is flesh, and what has been born of the spirit is spirit. You should not marvel that I told you, you must all be born from above. The wind blows where it wills, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from and where it goes to. Thus is everyone who has been born of the Spirit. I love that Jesus does this, and we see it often in his conversations. People start a conversation with him and uh, perhaps try to direct it in a certain direction, and Jesus kind of uh, cuts the, the conversation off short and takes it immediately to the actual core issue that is really uh, at the disturbing that person in the in the most profound part of his soul Jesus sees right to the core of who Nicodemus is and knows what it is that he needs an answer to so he doesn't thank him for his kind words he doesn't waste time with pleasantries he goes straight to I know what you're here for Nicodemus and I've got your answer you're concerned about God's kingdom and about being a part of it well, I, I'm going to tell you the solemn truth. Amen, amen. So be it, so be it. And it was kind of an idiom of the day of saying, beyond any shadow of doubt, with all certainty, I solemnly affirm to you this thing that I am about to say. This is a profound truth I'm going to speak to you. If one is not born from above, he cannot see God's kingdom. Now John loves to use ambiguous terms in his gospel. He loves to take terms that could mean two different things and have his readers struggle to understand which of the two meanings he has in mind or even as in this case indicate where Jesus has one thing in mind and the other person he's talking to seems to take it in the other meaning and misunderstands what Jesus is talking about because this word that we translate here born from above could also mean born again 
uh, born again. And clearly that is how Nicodemus interprets it. Although as the conversation continues, Jesus begins to speak of heavenly things versus earthly things as the things that only the one who comes from above can share. So uh, I think Jesus uh, here has the intent of using this word to speak of being born from above, being born from God. So, uh, one has to be born from above. And, but Nicodemus focuses on the other meaning, born again. And he says, what are you talking about? How do you expect an old man to be born again? And surely Nicodemus is thinking about himself. He is probably not a young guy. If he's reached the position of authority and influence that he has right now, he is probably an older man. And he says, you're asking the impossible. A man, an old man can't just crawl back into his mother's womb to be born a second time. And perhaps Nicodemus is concerned that Jesus is telling him, uh, you're too old. If you had been born right now, you'd be young enough to see the kingdom of God established, but you're too old, it's going to happen after you're dead. Maybe that's how Nicodemus was reading what Jesus was telling, for, telling him. But clearly, this is what Nicodemus longs for. He's taught this and read this in Scripture, and he knows that the whole Scripture is an open promise that God is going to resolve the issues that plague creation itself. He is going to bring a Prince of Peace who will bring the nations life and healing and establish the eternal kingdom of God. He knows this is coming and he longs to be a part of it. And now Jesus has said, you know what, if you want to be a part of it, if you want to even see God's kingdom, you have to be born from above. Or he understands him to say, you have to be born again. And he says, what are you saying, that it's impossible? This is almost, it almost sounds like when Jesus says that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than to get a rich person into heaven. It seems an impossibility. And Jesus explains again, truly, truly, I solemnly affirm to you, this is an absolute truth. If one is not born of water and spirit, he cannot enter into God's kingdom. So he's not now talking just about seeing God's kingdom, but participating in God's kingdom. And uh, as he continues, he makes a contrast between flesh and spirit. So I think here we should parallel this idea of being born of water to being born of the flesh and being or, born of spirit to born of spirit in the second, uh, in verse 6. But uh, he says, you have to be born two different ways to get into God's kingdom. There is a birth of water, and I don't think John here is talking about baptism. I think he's talking about physical birth. And the first absolute sure indicator that a birth is about to take place is when, as we say it, a mother's water breaks. And the amniotic fluid uh, comes out, and that is a, a clear signal that a baby is about to enter the world. A birth is about to take place, and the baby is born of water. That is the birth of flesh that he talks about in verse 6. But there's another birth Jesus is talking about. So he's not talking about crawling back into your mother's womb and doing this whole thing all over again. He's not just talking about a repeat He's talking about a different kind of birth, a birth from above. What has been born of the flesh is flesh. Nicodemus, you've had one birth. You've had this physical birth. You are here now talking to me. You've experienced the one kind of birth, but that's not enough to get you into the kingdom of God. Now that might be a shocking thing for a religious expert like Nicodemus to hear because I'm sure he thought uh, that he was okay. Surely he was one of the brightest and best. He was one of the most observant Jews of his day. People looked up to him to figure out how to please God because he was a, a shining example to others. And for Jesus to say to him, uh, yeah, you've got one part of what you need. You need to be alive. 
to be in the kingdom of God. But there's another thing that you have not had yet that you need to have before you can enter the kingdom of God. What has been born of the Spirit is spirit. You might be troubled that I capitalized that in verse 6 both times. And what I mean by, to say by that is not that uh, what God brings about in us when we are born of God makes us God. I'm not trying to say that at all. But I think the point he's saying here is that there are two categories of existence we're talking about. There's flesh existence, which is born out of what flesh can accomplish. And I think John here is using flesh much like the Apostle Paul would to describe what the world on its own without God intervening, what the world on its own produces. Flesh can make that kind of birth happen. Here you are, look at you. Yes, what is born of the flesh is flesh. That's one order of existence. But when God does it, it's a God thing. When it comes out of the Spirit of God, when it's accomplished by God himself supernaturally, then this is a God reality. It's a whole different order of things. And what God means to accomplish in you is something only God can accomplish. Now for Nicodemus, this was a whole different way of thinking because as a Pharisee, his efforts were all focused on understanding God's commandments and keeping them so that God would be pleased with him. And uh, he always felt that it's just a matter of understanding what God wants from me and then doing it, and that's it. All that is required is my willingness to obey. And Nicodemus was confident he was willing to obey God. And Jesus says, no, it's not about what you can do. God has to do something, or you're never even going to see the kingdom of God, much less participate in it. God has to do something new in you. You should not marvel that I told you you must all be born from above. And here again, he, he does another word play. He's been using the word spirit here, clearly, I think, uh, to refer to the Spirit of God, capital S, the Spirit. Uh, but in the Greek, and this is an interesting thing that happens both in Greek and in Hebrew, they're very different languages, and yet we have the same thing. In Greek, the word pneuma, from which we get pneumatic tires, uh, pneuma means spirit, but it also has the meaning of wind. The Hebrew ruach means also spirit or wind, breath. Uh, it can mean both things. And John here kind of plays with this by switching his meaning. Uh, Jesus here switches the meaning from talking about spirit as in the Holy Spirit, God who is spirit, and talks about the wind as a, an example for us of the activity of the spirit of God. The wind blows where it wills, and you hear its sound. And here's the thing, the wind does its thing. You're sitting around, and it blows, or it doesn't, and what direction it blows, and what it's up to, you have absolutely no control over it. And yet, you can sense the wind. You can perceive its effect around you. You can't see it. You have no control over it, but you are aware that it is powerfully at work around you. In fact, it surrounds you completely. It's always there. You don't know where it comes from. You don't know where it goes to. That's the kind of birth I'm talking about. It's the kind of thing God does in you that goes beyond comprehension, explanation, and human control. It's not something we orchestrate. It's not something we can make happen. It's something only God can do. It's fully in God's hands and in his control. Now, for a Pharisee who was convinced that the way to get God's favor was just to keep his commandments and do it right. Surely this was a great challenge, the idea of letting go of that 
and saying, you know what, it's not about what I can accomplish. It's not about asking God, God, what do I need to do for you to receive me into your kingdom? It's about surrendering to God, doing what he wills in us. And it's an open-ended thing. Jesus describes it as something as mysterious and transcendent as the wind itself. That's what it's like with everyone who has been born of the Spirit. I have a question from these verses. <clears throat> Jesus differentiated two planes of existence, fleshly or earthly, and of God's Spirit or heavenly. He said we must exist in both to participate in his kingdom. What is the key to being born of God's Spirit? And why did the religious expert Nicodemus struggle to understand this? Let's keep going. Verses 9 through 12. Nicodemus answered and said to, them, said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, You are Israel's teacher, and you do not know these things? Truly, truly I say to you, we speak what we have known, and we bear witness to what we have seen, yet all of you do not receive our witness. If I spoke to all of you about earthly things and you do not believe, how will you all believe if I should tell you about heavenly things? So Nicodemus responds to Jesus and admits he doesn't get it. How can all this be? How does it? And maybe he's, his, his Pharisee mind is saying, just tell me what I got to do, Jesus. Tell me what I got to do. Uh, what, what ritual, what sacrifice, what? Just tell me what I have to do and I'll do it. How can, how can you get this birth from above? <clears throat> and Jesus kind of rebukes him, but really in rebuking Nicodemus, it's not so much a personal attack on Nicodemus as it is a rejection of the whole Pharisaic framework because all of a sudden he switches to the you plural, the you all. Uh, so he's not just talking to Nicodemus. He's talking to Nicodemus and the people he has joined himself to, the tribe he has become a part of. And Jesus is warning him that these guys have got it wrong. Nicodemus, if you want to find what you're looking for, you've got to be willing to break away from that. But first he says, you are Israel's teacher. That was the point of pride for the Pharisees. They may not be the wealthiest, they may not be the most politically connected, but when people wanted to know what the Bible said, they went to the Pharisees. And they considered themselves to be the teachers of Israel. It's the kind of attitude Paul describes of the Jews in Romans when he says you're a teacher of the fools, an instructor of, of the simple, the guide to the blind. That's the attitude of the Pharisees. You are Israel's teacher and you don't get this? You don't understand this stuff I'm talking about? There's a rebuke there. And it's a rebuke against the Pharisees and their rejection of Jesus and his teaching. He says, and this is interesting, Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak what we have known. Who is we? Who is Jesus including with himself? We might think it's the disciples, but at this point in his ministry, the disciples are pretty clueless themselves. I think he's referring to the kind of witness that John will continue to talk at length about in his gospel and the kind that Nicodemus himself has already alluded to. How do I know you come from God as teacher? Because the signs you are performing, you could not perform unless God were with you. 
one of the themes John will develop throughout his gospel is this idea that not only is Jesus bearing witness to himself as he speaks, but that the Holy Spirit is confirming his words and God the Father is performing miraculous signs all in confirmation that he is speaking truth and that his words are from God. And I think that's what Jesus is referring to when he says, we speak every witness that is involved in what Jesus has been doing. The confirming activity of the Father who had revealed to John the Baptist that the one upon you see the Spirit descend as a dove and remain, that is the one that all these other witnesses of God that have surrounded the ministry of Jesus thus far. We speak what we have known. We bear witness to what we have seen. And now the you is plural. Yet all of you do not receive our witness. If I spoke to all of you about earthly things and you do not believe, how are you going to believe if I should tell you about heavenly things? Jesus indicates to Nicodemus, I want to go deeper. There's more I want to tell you. But if you can't get past the most basic, basic step here, there's no point in trying to go any further. Now, what, in what sense has Jesus borne witness to many people that has been rejected? Well, I'm thinking about the passage that came just before this one where he went to the temple and cleansed the temple and cast out all those making market and said, do not make my father's house a house of market. And the response of the leadership was to challenge Jesus and to dismiss him. And that was an earthly matter. Don't make worship of God marketplace uh, worship. Don't turn it into a transaction. That's easy to understand. There's nothing terribly numinous or difficult to grasp about that. There's not some great transcendent thing behind that. It's just very simple. God's not interested in transaction. He's interested in a genuine relationship. If you don't receive that, if you don't receive what I have to tell you about the basic things, how can I go deeper? If you're not willing to trust me on the introductory level stuff, how can I get to the profound stuff that I came to share? Sadly, with Jesus, too many people can never get past the most basic things he came to bring because they get stuck on step one. Jesus is encouraging Nicodemus to not get stuck there. I have a question from these verses. Jesus had just told the people running the temple that his father's house should not be made a house of market, that our approach to God should not follow a transactional pattern. Why do you think people like Nicodemus struggled to understand these earthly matters Jesus brought up? Let's keep reading. And no one has gone up into heaven except the one coming down out of heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone believing in him might have eternal life. After his uh, words of rebuke and correction, and I think Jesus is trying to give Nicodemus a heads up, you're going to have to be willing to choose between me and the Pharisees. This group of people who reject my witness, if you want to get in on what I'm talking to you about, you're going to have to be willing to break with them. But he does go on to explain this to Nicodemus. He does go on to the deeper things. He does go beyond earthly matters to speak of the heavenly things he has to talk to him about. How can these things be, Nicodemus asked. Jesus explains. No one has gone up into heaven except the one coming down out of heaven, the guy who was already there to begin with, the Son of Man. 
Jesus here chooses to use this title for the Messiah that comes from Daniel 7, to the one who comes on the clouds and to whom the ancient of day, days hands over the eternal kingdom and he will establish the kingdom of God and rule over all the nations forever and ever. The Messiah. Jesus is telling Nicodemus that uh, when we're talking of this heavenly reality, this birth from above accomplished by the very Spirit of God, none of us has gone up there. That is beyond us. Except one person. There is one who brought heaven down to us. There is one who was already there to begin with. And he has come down to us, the promised Messiah, Jesus himself. <clears throat> and how exactly is Jesus going to make possible Nicodemus' entry into the kingdom of God? Well, he says, just the way Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. In Numbers, we have this account where the people of Israel again, and it, it, it's wearisome at this point in the biblical narrative because it's all they do is gripe and complain, but yet again they start complaining that they don't have the kind of food they want. God has given them this manna, this miraculous food directly from God that he provides for them daily and they've not gone hungry a single day, but... They say, We're, we despise this loathsome food you've given us, God. Oh, that we were back in Egypt eating melons and cucumbers and garlic and leeks and onions. And uh, the, the, what happens as a result of that is that serpents uh, appear among the, the people of Israel and their poison is lethal. People get bitten by these serpents and they're dying and God instructs Moses, make a serpent, and place it on a pole where people can see it and anyone who looks on that serpent on the pole will be healed of the venom coursing through their veins. And that's what happened. He made a bronze serpent, put it on a pole and people who had been bitten looked to the serpent and were healed of their poison. Jesus says, that's, that's what I've come to do. I too am going to be lifted up on a pole so that everyone who looks on me and believes and puts his faith in me might have eternal life. This is how the birth from above is going to happen. This birth of the Spirit of God. I'm going to make it possible by giving my life for the sin of the world so that you can, you who have been infected by the poison of sin, who are mortally wounded by it, who are destined for the grave, you may look upon me in faith and be healed of your poison. That is how this birth is going to happen. You're going to turn away from you. You're going to turn to me. You're going to put your faith not in your own ability to accomplish something. You're going to put your faith in my ability to heal your wound. Perhaps the necessary first step is going to be that you're going to have to recognize you are mortally wounded to begin with. That you are not okay, Nicodemus. That unless I perform a miracle on your behalf, you are destined for the grave. But anyone who turns to me in faith, I'll be raised up so that you may be healed and have eternal life. have a question from these verses. Speaking of heavenly things, Jesus spoke of heaven and of himself as the only one who can open up for us true and eternal life. Why are these things the deeper matters of our faith? And how do we grow in them? Well, 
Let's read verses 16 through 18. For in this way God loved the cosmos. He gave the Son, the one and only, so that everyone believing in him should not be destroyed, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the cosmos so that he could condemn the cosmos, but so that the cosmos could be saved through him. The one believing in him is not condemned, but the one who is not believing has already been condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. Jesus explains further what he's talking about, about being lifted up so that people may look on him and have eternal life. He says this is how God has demonstrated his love. And mo many translations you're familiar with of this verse, it's probably the, mo the most well-known verse in the whole Bible. For God so loved the world is probably how you're accustomed to reading that. But uh, that so there I think is often misunderstood as uh, the way we would commonly say so much. God loved the world so much that. But that's really not the sense of the Greek there. It's the idea so as in thus, in this manner. This is how God loved the world. Let me explain to you. You want to know how I know God loves the world? Let me show you. This is how God loved. And I translated that cosmos instead of world. The Greek there is cosmon uh, in the accusative. Uh, that is uh, the Greek word, of course, it, it means world, but in the sense of everything. And, uh, of course, in our world today, when we hear world, we think planet. We think of the planet Earth spinning and rotating around a sun, hurtling through space as one tiny speck among innumerable other planets and comets and stars and systems. And uh, we think of world as this ball we happen to be on. That's not the sense in which people in the first century would have understood the word cosmon or cosmos. They, to them, that meant everything. It's more like our word universe or cosmos, which is why I've translated it cosmos. God loved all of creation, not just this planet, but everything that exists, God has shown his love to it. And John wants us to understand this about what Jesus did on the cross. He came to rescue not just sinners. He came to rescue all of creation from the power and taint of sin. God loved the cosmos in this manner. He gave the Son not just any old Son, the one and only. There is only one Son. He gave the only Son so that everyone, any single person, there is no limitation here. There's no exclusion. Every single person who puts his faith in him will not be destroyed. Uh, that's that word there. Uh, uh, it, it can be translated perish, but it, its core meaning is the idea of destruction, of ruin, of utter devastation. And uh, this is what sin does. It ruins, it destroys, it annihilates, it, it, it just tears everything apart and leaves behind nothing. It deconstructs things till there's nothing left. Sin is best illustrated by the concept of entropy. And people who, whose lives are affected by sin, and that's all of us, are facing this inescapable destruction. God loved everything so much. He sent this one and only Son so that he would die, so that any who puts his faith in him will not have to endure the destruction they're already headed towards but will instead enjoy eternal life. 
In fact, God didn't even send the Son into the cosmos. He didn't enter creation in the incarnation so that he could step in and say, you guys are all condemned. And that word we translate condemned also means judge. To judge or condemn. To judge and issue a negative uh, judgment against Some people think that that's what God's doing. That he's looking with disapproval on creation. And that the reason he stepped into creation was just to point out to us all how wrong we are. How bad and evil and wicked we are. Just to kind of get it off his chest. That's not at all why God sent the Son into creation. He actually came so that creation itself could be saved through him. We were already being destroyed. We were already on a path to utter ruin. He stepped in to stop that. Not to make it worse, but to actually fix it. And here's what happens. The person who is believing in him is not condemned. You are issued a a ruling of not guilty. Now the one who is not believing in him, the one who refuses to put his faith in Jesus, is already condemned. It's already happened. You have already been bitten. The poison courses through your veins. You're already dying. Jesus didn't come to make it worse. You were already dying when he showed up to say, let me save you. But your problems are not Jesus' fault. They're things you brought upon yourself. And the devastation that works its way through your life and relationships is not God's fault. That was already happening before Jesus even showed up. So when you hear about Jesus and his invitation to come to him in faith, he didn't show up to tell you how wrong you are and to condemn you and reject you. He came to say, I know what your problem is. Let me fix it. But you have to put your faith in me. You have to let me fix it. So Jesus didn't come to condemn us. He came to save us. And people who don't believe, they're not condemned the moment they refuse to believe in Jesus. They were already condemned. They were already destroyed. They were already dead. Hearing about Jesus didn't make it any worse. Because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. Here's the thing about Jesus. He doesn't offer a solution to our problem. He offers the solution. He's the one and only. There's no other coming. There's no plan B or C or D. There's no other avenue going to open up for anybody. The only way creation is rescued from sin and death is what the Son accomplished. I have a question from these verses. Jesus didn't come to judge and condemn the cosmos. He came to save it and any human being who wants to be saved from sin and its power. Why do you think people often want to make God the villain in the story of the cosmos? Let's finish reading verses 19 through 21. Now this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the cosmos, and humans love the darkness rather than the light, for their works were evil. For the one accomplishing base things hates the light and does not come to the light so that his works will not be exposed. But the one who is working truth comes to the light so that his works may be revealed, that they are being worked in God. Here's the condemnation. It's not something Jesus brought when he showed up. But 
Uh, here's the condemnation. And notice how God's intervention in Jesus changes the parameters of our condemnation. It, if he had never showed up, we're all just condemned. That's all there is to it. But now there has been introduced to the equation the option for rescue. So now the only condemnation that remains is for people who obstinately reject rescue. This is the condemnation. That the light has come into the cosmos. The light has invaded this fallen creation. And humans love the darkness rather than the light. God's message to us became flesh and he spoke to us and he communicated to us and we look upon that and say you know what I like my darkness better I prefer my messed up life to what Jesus offers why why do humans love the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil the things we're doing are evil and we know that when light shines everything becomes exposed when we're accomplishing base things not noble not glorious not commendable things worthy of emulation when we're doing the the basest, worst, trashiest things we can imagine. We're not drawn to light. We don't want to come to the light. We don't want our filth to be made evident to everyone around us. We'd rather hide. That's why evil has thrived so much in the age of social media because there's such an anonymity in cyberspace. People can lob grenades of all kinds and throw out cruelty and untruths and all kinds of things and hide. People don't want to be exposed as liars and crooks. As a parent, I'm sure you've experienced this. Sometimes you can tell your child is up to no good just by their behavior. Not because you've actually seen them do the thing, but because all of a sudden they won't look you in the eye. All of a sudden they don't want to talk. All of a sudden they want to stay locked up in their room. They hide from anything that might expose the darkness and because they love it and they don't want to give it up. Jesus says that's, that's the problem with the human condition. Salvation has been issued for anyone. Indiscriminate rescue has been extended creation-wide. No hoops to jump through. No grand requirements. No huge expenses. Just faith. And even though God could not have made it any more accessible than he has, still people don't want to hear anything about it because they love the darkness too much. They don't want to be free of it. And they know it's killing them. They know that their sinful patterns of living are self-destructive, but they don't care. Because they have loved their darkness more than the light. There are some who are actually striving to be free. Who have been longing for God to step in and rescue them from this darkness. Who are repulsed and filled with regret and shame at the darkness in their own hearts and lives and would not love nothing more than to be free of it, who strive to draw near to God. I kind of think Nicodemus was one of these types of people. People who are working truth 
and who want to live not based on the latest fad, but upon actually what is genuinely true. And God alone knows what is objectively true. They want to draw near to the light. They want to find that the things they've been doing are actually things that God was at work in them to do, that they were partnering with God in this, that they uh, were, were genuinely in pursuit of God because we know how easily we can be deceived and deceive ourselves and end up not being doing the right thing. We would long for it to be shown and found that we are actually on God's side of things, that we have rejected darkness and evil and are in the process of being rescued and belonging to God. There are people who are drawn to that like a moth to the flame. There are people who will let their lives be consumed in that pursuit of the light of God. That's the kind of people who will be born from above. That's the kind of people who will not only see, but enter into the kingdom of God. People who actually want to be done with darkness. I have a question from these final verses. Why do you think we often prefer the darkness of evil and all its attending shame and guilt rather than rescue from it at the hands of Jesus and a life lived in his truth? We're afflicted by a terminal condition. You might have noticed we're all going to die. We don't talk about it a lot. In the meantime, we strive to make some sense of our lives, for our lives to have some meaning. We try to find a tribe that helps us define who we are, and we throw ourselves into that identity and that purpose. But what if uh, there's something more than that? What if there's something, and I think deep down we know this, what if there's something not right that needs to be made right. Something that no matter how hard I try, I can't seem to shake. What if, what if there's a way to break past this into something eternal? Is it possible to even talk about something like eternal life and perhaps more profound than that yet? Is it possible to find a way to be free of guilt and shame and so many base and horrible things that we know are in our cores? The serpent has bit us and sunk his fangs deep. The poison of sin courses through our veins. The good news is that Jesus saw that. God Almighty saw that and sent the one and only Son to us to die on a cross so that all we would have to do is turn to Him, trust our hearts and lives to Him, and He does everything. He heals us of the poison. He makes us new. We have been born of the flesh. We need another bir being birthed. We need God to make us be born in Him. A God thing. Jesus came to make that a possibility for us. And it all boils down to this one question Are you going to love your darkness? more than God's light. I pray and hope that that's not the case. Let me say a word of prayer. Dear God, thank you that you look upon us condemned and on a path to destruction and you were not repulsed by us, but you have reached out to us in love. All of your creation you have reached out to in love to redeem and heal and restore. And God, help us to hate the darkness, to despise it,
to want nothing more than to be done with it forever and to turn to you, Lord Jesus, that you may heal our wound and cause a miraculous birth in us by your Spirit, which will lead us, guide us into your kingdom and life eternal. Lord Jesus, I pray for everybody listening to your word today that you will grant us hearts that will turn from darkness to your light and be rescued. I pray all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.